Well, good morning and welcome to St. Michael and All Angels on this first Sunday after Christmas. We hope you all had a Merry Christmas. Know that your parish has prayed for all people right around the world, but we pray for those who are ill, those who are alone, and for those who are still traveling. So standing as you are able, let us continue our worship by singing our hymn 93, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Purify our conscience, almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, 
so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. 
But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It has been said that the Roman Catholic Church is a Good Friday church. It emphasizes the suffering of Jesus, the physical price he paid on our behalf. That the overall ethos of that expression of the church is one of penitence and contrition. And it has been said that the Orthodox Church is an Easter Sunday church. It emphasizes the path that Christ made possible for us when in his rising, he took our humanity into the Godhead. That the overall ethos of that expression of the church is our deification, living further and further into our union with God. And then it is said that the Anglican Church is a Christmas Day church that we find our understanding of God and of our relationship with God in the incarnation. I don't know about you, but I'm happy to accept this as our identity. So much is revealed about God, about God's relationship with humanity and about God's intention for us in the incarnation. First, the incarnation, God's assumption of our humanity tells us that humanity is good. From the very beginning in creation, God declared humanity not just good, but very good. And more than that, God said, let us make humankind in our own image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. We Anglicans tend to easily accept this elevated regard for humanity. We agree with the psalmist who says, you have made us a little lower than the angels. You adorn us with glory and honor. This is a very different understanding than some of our Christian brothers and sisters. The reformed tradition holds to the total depravity of humankind, that since the fall, we have no capacity within ourselves to choose the good to, or to choose God. And while we can debate provenient grace and other theologies, the incarnation slices right through this discussion. If humanity is inherently totally depraved, how could a good, sinless God become one of us? It would be totally incompatible with God's goodness to take into his person corruption. We are good. We are the very locus of God's entry into the world and the venue through which God enacts his salvation of the world. Second, the incarnation tells us that our embodied lives matter. Our ordinary, mundane, earthly existence is not shunned by God, but embraced. 
More than this, God taking on human flesh tells us that our bodily existence matters relationally. In Jesus, God comes to share in the breadth of our human condition, our joy, our pain, our loss, our love, our sickness, and even our death. God dwells with us in the midst of our sorrows and our suffering and our brokenness. And we encounter God in the fleshy details of our lives. When we care for our children or our parents, when we carry out the responsibilities of our jobs, when we engage folks in the community as we drive, as we shop, as we work for the common good. In taking on flesh, God declares his solidarity with us. If God can be born in a smelly, crowded, noisy barn, then God can be born anywhere. He can be born in me and he can be born in you. Third, the incarnation means that God moves towards us. You know, we tend to engage our faith thinking that we have to move from where we are to where God is. When we talk about growing spiritually, praying more, studying scripture, our image for this is growing towards God, moving towards God. The incarnation tells us that God comes to us. He makes the move to reconcile us to him so that there is no space between us, so that we might know how beloved we are to him. God overcomes the gap between us from God's side. In this, we see how deeply God desires to be in relationship with us. This truth should cause us to feel safe and loved and wanted. And God comes to us not once, but over and over. We are to have eyes that see God incarnate all around us, for he is here. Finally, the incarnation tells us that in the sacrificial work of Jesus, we are redeemed. Jesus didn't come simply to set a good example for us to follow. He came to rescue us. And it seems that he could only do that by living with us and dying for us. In the early church, there was a lot of debate about how much like us Jesus was. Was he fully human except for having a divine mind? Was he fully human except for having a divine will? These issues were debated at the church councils over years and chunks of the church ended up leaving over them. The church wanting to give up nothing of the fullness of Christ's humanity and the fullness of his divinity came up with a beautiful definition of the nature of Christ. Christ is one person in two natures, divine and human, uniting the two natures without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. It was important that the church keep insisting that Jesus be fully human. Because as Athanasius, one of our early church fathers famously said, what has not been assumed has not been redeemed. Jesus had to become all of us if he was going to save all of us. And so all of who we are is redeemed in Christ. In Jesus, we get a definitive glimpse of God. Before the incarnation, we tried as best we could to know God's will for us, to understand what was important to God, to live in ways that God desired. But we always struggled as if we could only see through a mirror darkly. But in Jesus, God is revealed. God puts skin on the divine attributes so that we can see the life of faith that he desires for us. And this definitive glimpse of God informs how we read and live into Holy Scripture. If Jesus is the definitive revelation of God, then our understanding of Scripture must be consistent with that revelation. We don't hold that there is a previous wrathful judging God of the Old Testament and a new gracious forgiving God of the New Testament. God's character 
hasn't changed over the arc of scripture. Our understanding of God has expanded. It might be that we, in our creatureliness, misunderstood God. It might be that we created stories to explain our own desires and actions in ways that claim God's sanction. As Christians, it is appropriate that we read scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ. If actions and motivations and intentions attributed to God in scripture are inconsistent with a revelation of God in Jesus Christ, we are called to revisit our understanding of these stories. And so we Anglicans are proudly and gratefully a people of the incarnation. We know that we are created good. We trust that by becoming one of us, God shows us that we are beloved to him. We relate to a God who has chosen to take on all that comprises our lives, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful. We are grateful that God makes the move toward us to repair our relationship instead of waiting for us to figure it out and get it right. And we are assured that in Jesus' faithful obedience, messy, imperfect humanity is made right with God. In his death, in his resurrection, and in his ascension into the Godhead, humanity has been taken up and redeemed into the life of God. Ours is a faith that holds that God so loved the world that God became one of us to live our lives, to suffer our death, and to be raised to our resurrection. We are incarnation people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Standing as you are able. And turning to page six in your worship bulletins, let us say together the Nicene Creed. Together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Evangelism Commission, the Harvest Prayer Team, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, 
that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray for Joe, our president, Greg, our governor, Eric, our mayor. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray for all those on the St. Michael prayer list and for David Boyette, Shannon Fuller, Norma Hurd, Kay Marhoff, Linda Moore, Ann and Jim Pacconi, John Shaver, Diana and David Torres, the Williamson family. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all those who have died, that your will for them will be fulfilled and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. We pray especially for Patricia Ann Grimes Thompson, Coke Williamson. Lord, in your mercy. Hasten, O oh Father, the coming of your kingdom and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy Behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us share a sign of God's peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Again, welcome to St. Michael and all angels this day. And no matter where you are watching from, know that you are welcome in this house of God. I have just a few announcements for you, and you may look in this, the inside covers of your worship bulletin. On Wednesday, January 5th, we have our Feast of the Epiphany. And as part of our 75th anniversary, we have the Reverend Bill Murray returning and leading us in that celebration. Uh, there will be the worship in church at 5.30, and then from 6.30 to 8, we have the burning of the greens, and that is always, always so much fun. In other news, we have several um, items. Uh, Project Moses has an opportunity to gather together. And if you flip on the back page, we also have a couple of items also. Prayer, does it make any difference? That's going to be led by Dr. Tim Smith and myself, and that starts January 16th. 
And we also have the Alpha class that begins on January 18th. So please take your bulletins home and just transfer all of those items that um, are really speaking to your heart about how to lift up your heart and continue on in your spiritual journey. Again, welcome to St. Michael. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you gave Jesus Christ, your only Son, to be born for us, who by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit was made perfect man of the flesh of the Virgin Mary, his mother, so that we might be delivered from the bondage of sin and receive power to become your children. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, whoever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people and your word spoken through the prophets and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with blessed Michael and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Please stand. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.